right on top. And we are live. Hello. What up, Terry Moore? Terry Moore. Beating us to the chat. Yep. Are you yeah. watching the uh, YouTubes on the TV or are you watching it on something else? How many people we got on YouTube, Chris? Uh, as far as I can tell, two. two. Oh, somebody else is out there not so, talking. So Come Doug, on is now. There. Doug is there. Oh, Doug? Okay. It's probably Doug. Oh. Is it Doug? Is it Doug? Are you out there? Is it Doug? It's a Doug. Who beat Doug? Oh, it is Doug. Hey! It is Doug. Hey! <laughs> good call. Good call. <laughs> oh, and Stephen. Stephen Orr is here, Stephen too. Stephen Orr. Mr. Orr. Let me take this opportunity to thank you for your assistance last week. And oh, I believe Chris will, will say more uh, once we get recording, recording. Yeah, but yeah, I wanted to thank you. He's taking a break from editing. Oh, all right. Yeah, so 48 and 49 are in my, uh, are my Google Drive. So I just mm -hmm. need to get them published. Okay. So big thank you to Mr. St Mr. Stephen Orr. So, well, I mean. Why, why dilly dally? Let's uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get let's going go. with the show. So, all right, in three, two, one. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Comic Addiction. This is episode 150. I am one of your co hosts, Chris Parton, and with me, as always, is Mr. Ed Moore. Ed, how are you? I am just peachy keen, man. Peachy keen. Peachy keen. You use that too. Awesome. I use that as peachy well. Peachy keen. People uh, younger than me look at me strangely when I say that. So, well, that's fine. Oh, I people know. Young, I, I, at this point, you know, people younger than me, that's like 90% of the world, I feel. So, it's, you, know, <laughs> you know, it's like... A, so everything you say gets yeah, looked at strangely. Yeah, everybody looks at me weird. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with that. You, can, you can't call out the, well, when I say this, it's just like, if I, if I say something and they don't look at me strange, then I find that weird. Ooh, so. yeah, then I look at them strange. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I use it? cool beans a lot also. Yes, I do too, yeah. It's a, cool it's a, beans. it's a, uh, and we're not, you know, we're, we're still a couple years off from one another, but still yeah. we're sort of in that same, the same vocabulary. Yep. So yeah. maybe it's, it's comic geekness or something that maybe, does it. I don't who know knows. what, whatever our common condition is. Yep. So, uh, so a couple things, episode 150. Yay. I guess milestone mm. episode. So, um, uh, one thing I did want to, uh, bring up about 150 and I'll probably bring it up at 200 whenever we reach that and 250 and 300, you know, but every 50 episodes, um, just to kind of, you know, give a little, a little tiny little bit of history of the show. Um, we started the show, um, in my car on the way back from Charlotte. Uh, I was at heroes con, uh, June 18th, 2017. Well, I say June 18th. I think that's when the show got published so that was monday so whatever that weekend was i'll have to go back and look it's always it's always gray i always have to go back and see what day it was but i was coming back from heroes con on sunday um that was the same weekend i got to meet um the guys from comic geek speak they they were there um i remember taking a big box of trade paperbacks for them to do some giveaway or something uh so i got to meet um I know it was Brian Deemer and I'm pretty sure Pants was there. I don't think Peter was there, um, but I forget who all else was there. Um, so I got to meet them briefly, uh, but I had been listening to them for quite some time up to that point, like everybody else had. Yep. Um, I did get to go to watch uh, iFanboy um, had a live recording of their show okay. there at the con so i me and a buddy of mine went and sat in on that so that was pretty fun so i got to see sort of for the first time you know the behind the scenes of what it looked like to be doing podcasting you know with the microphones and the you know the all the sound boards and and whatnot and those three guys are i mean they went to school for media for production and stuff like that so they 
they knew what they were doing as far as the technical end of it. I think they would even argue at that point, they were still trying to figure out. And I think they were up to like episode 85 or something like that at the time. So, but again, had listened to them for a while. So it was one of those things already had listened to podcasting for quite some time already. And, and sort of, I don't know, it was one of those things, you know, you kind of, you kind of see it, kind of meet some folks, you kind of talk about it for a while, you know, and things like that. And you just kind of get, all right, it's just on pull trigger. So leaving town, I stopped by um, Best Buy um, and bought a headset mic. Already had my laptop with me, plugged in the laptop. I'd already downloaded Audacity and just as I drove back, you know, drove back to, uh, to the house from Charlotte, had a long drive back to Durham and, uh, and just chatted away. So that became the first episode of comic addiction on the road. Cool. And so I did that for a while. So, um, so yeah, so starting in 07, we're only at episode 150. That seems, you know, people probably, the math doesn't quite end up, uh, add up, well, it's, but it's 10 episodes a year. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> But we, uh, I, and, and I think that uh, ten episodes is like a a break in uh, a podcast life. I think most don't make it to ten, but if you make it to ten, then you are. Oh yeah, you're you know, dozens, hundreds into yeah. yeah into so yeah. I think for some reason ten episodes is something that is difficult for folks to stay motivated to do. Yeah. So I got, I was lucky. Comic Addiction was already a website at the time. So, um, you know, already had folks working on the site, writing stuff, articles and reviews and stuff like that. So, you know, we all kind of got together and decided to do the show. Um, Paul, you know, was on the show all the time with me. And then we brought in Angela and Rob and, and Corwin and, you know, and, and just sort of grew from there. Now, Comic Addiction, you know, we go on hiatus for a while. Image Addiction became a thing. Boom addiction became a thing. Uh, after sh- the only show we didn't call addiction was the Aftershock show. <laughs> don't forget, we released one episode of the Bottom Shelf podcast, and we did one episode of the Bottom Shelf one. Yeah, yes. um, and then you know, I even did there was a DC show that Paul and I did called DC Core. Uh, I think we did that for like seven episodes. Um, so, so still did podcasting, but comic addiction kind of got put on the side. Uh, side burner for a while so uh, but it it has been fun the last uh, couple months bringing it back and and getting to this point so we'll you know i think i think we found our groove and so we'll kind of yeah. do this for a while and you know if something else hits us and we want to go a different direction with something else we'll do that so but for now we're doing comic addiction and that's a good time so uh one thing uh you know we kind of uh you know you see ed and i here we're on the cameras we're all we're doing the doing the voice of of the show and everything like that but you know we've talked about in the last couple episodes where the podcast the audio portion of the show has not been um is up to date uh on all the podcast catchers as youtube has been and part of that is you know getting a new laptop from work and all this other stuff and, and it locking it down so i can't install software and i just i'm kind of out of luck on that part so um is what it is I still can do the show this way and that's great and all but we needed some help and in doing so um steven or from just another fanboy um is is uh stepping in i guess to help us out uh on future shows hopefully he's already edited 147 48 and 49 so 48 and 49 are in my google drive to get posted to the site uh for 147 is already up there uh and steven since you're in the chat uh not only thank you for your help um but i think you're probably gonna have a steady job uh uh, for a little, for, for a while. <laughs> so, oh, he says 149 will be yeah. done tomorrow. Yeah, I was okay. going to say, if you see the, the comments. Yeah, I saw yeah, that. So, so, so 148 will be up. Ready yeah. to go. Yeah. So we'll, uh, so thank you for, for all your help, buddy. And uh, and uh, you are currently uh, on the payroll, like Ed and I are. And, uh, 
and you now have the full position of executive producer of the podcast, whether you rather, whether, uh, whether you want it or not. <laughs> and Steven, that, that makes you um, parallel, I think with uh, our much esteemed colleague, uh, Peter Rios at uh, comic geek speak. I believe he was executive producing that show too. So yep. there you go. There you go. So welcome to the family. And then Doug, as always, Doug remains our third chair. One of these days, we'll actually have Doug on the show. That indeed, might a, indeed. Might be a good thing because we definitely are in sync with Doug when it comes to the type of books and everything that we're reading. So, so Doug, one of these days, buddy, you need to uh, get out of the chat and come on the show. So we'll get, we'll have to set that up here. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into uh, all the other stuff, the regular stuff of the show. We'll jump into uh, FOC first off. These are books that are coming out, or excuse me, not coming out, but these will, uh, FOC is cutting off on October 3rd, which is next, next Monday. So let me go ahead and pop this up on the screen and we will get going on this. So what you got, sir? All right. My first pick is the fourth Usagi Yojimbo trade of the color IDW issues uh, entitled Crossroads. This covers issues 22 through 26. Let's see, two, three, four, five, six. Well, that's convenient because the next trade paperback they put out will be their last because yep. <laughs> um, Stan moved from IDW to Dark Horse. So uh, this is what he went to IDW to do is to produce Usagi in color. So those have been uh, periodically collected, and this is the fourth of apparently what is going to be five issues uh, of this trade. Um, five issues each trade, so grab it while it's hot, because um, I don't know uh, what the rights are post-producing them now that Stan has left. I don't know if they'll be able to reprint them or if all of the printings are first printings and that's all there's going to be, I, I don't mm. know what the situation with it will be. Um, I can say having watched a lot of what dark horse did with the property and uh, producing materials, um, IDW did not do as good a job. Um, I don't think that IDW was invested in the um, project the the property quite like dark horse had been so um i don't know you know they they suffered maybe from some motivation or some i don't know i you know i, I don't want to trash idw that's not what i'm trying to oh, do sure yeah. but but there was there was a, a diminishment of available materials let's say and i don't believe that was directed by mr sakai because I can't imagine why he would move from publisher A to publisher B and then tell publisher B, no, I don't want to make as much stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd know. rather not make any more. Yeah. Money. I, I don't want to do I all can, that. I just yeah. let's, you know, so I, I can only think that it must've been office decisions that, yeah. uh, that fostered that. But uh, nonetheless, this is the fourth trade paperback. All of these are in color, five issues, 22 through 26. Um, I believe that is a storyline. It's a complete storyline or maybe a couple complete storylines, um, mainly involving his uh, Padawan. You can see over here in the yellow on the image, uh, Yuichi, uh, uh, Yukichi, sorry. Um, so that is the, the character that they focused a lot more in these issues from IDW uh, in the latter portion of that run. Go get it. 20 bucks, five books. Come on. Yep. It's Usagi. It's Stan Sakai. It's, yeah. Did IDW republish any of the Dark Horse stuff? Or is no. it just strictly what they've been publishing? No, just, um, let me think. Well, well, okay. They did republish a lot of early stuff, uh, and, I don't think they had gotten into the dark horse years yet Oh, okay. Uh, gotcha. that were black and white and mm -hmm. they were producing those in color. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, and actually they, they had been making trades of those each um, volume, let's call it was six issues and they were old black and white. They were original black and whites that they reproduced in color. Mm -hmm. 
but it's my understanding that that's all that they had at the time were the rights to reproduce those in color. They could not reproduce in black and white. Oh, okay. that was gotcha. Um, I think Dark Horse had, or maybe even if you go, maybe Fantagraphics still have the the rights for the black mm. and white stuff, even though there was an early portion of black and white that was produced prior to Fantagraphics. Yeah. But I, I believe yeah. they got the reproduction rights for that because those companies, um, Thoughts and Images, and um, I forget the name of the other company. They they don't even exist anymore. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, but yeah, they 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 do. They there is another series, and I believe they have put out four six issue sets, um, and three of those I believe have come out in trade paperback so far. And uh, fans are still waiting on the fourth to come out. Which again, now that he has moved the property, I I would imagine they still will because those were produced in color by idw right so yeah. they would have uh the the rights i would think to collect them in trade um maybe they're sore about it or something you know who knows i, I don't i haven't <laughs> seen it advertised that it's coming out so who right. knows if it will but yeah well it'll be interesting to see so but yeah I, i'm i'm with you i I did not pick up the colored stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I picked up the first issue and I just didn't pick up anymore. But I think I do need to go back and pick up these. These trades are pretty pretty affordable. So, And they, they are much more so than any trades that you will find of the original black and white material. Mm -hmm. So if you want to read them, um, the most cost-effective way would be, in some ways, unfortunately, to read them in color yeah. via those trades. Yeah, oh, much for sure. Much easier to get the yeah. his his first appearance uh, in uh, Albedo number two thoughts mm -hmm. and images uh, that is there are two right now up on Lone Star Comics one is a six point something for eight thousand yeah and one is a nine point eight for twenty four thousand yeah. Uh, yeah but that has been there uh, I think twenty four thousand must be too much because it's it's still there. Um, on eBay though, they go for close to that. They go for easily mm -hmm. over 20, uh, for a 9.8. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's insane. And, and the, the funny thing for me is, is that Albedo issue number two is his actual first appearance. Now, uh, I don't know, 20, maybe 20 to 30 stories later, is the first issue of his eponymously named book. Right. And it goes for five digits in a 9.8. And I'm like, well, that's not even, I mean, that's several yeah. years later. Yeah. And people are still, yeah. So it's a popular guy. Uh, yeah. Uh, the cartoon, runs, well, the cartoon runs did it and speculated. Oh, did that's it true. And, yeah. You know, so yeah. True, 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 true. All right. Um, I've got a book from Marvel cross gen. Tales. I will say here really, oh. really quickly. It, it seems like everyone is in favor, including Doug of getting Doug on the show. I don't know. If oh yes. So, I see all but, that. Yeah. So, uh, D Doug has, has fans already and, and we've never even heard him speak yet. So yeah. Yeah. He's he's gonna get on the show and have like really high pitched voice or something. Yeah, something uh, who, like, who, who knows? Very raspy voice. Oh no, we can't have a raspy voice. I don't. No, any, that that's me. I, I've got yeah, that one covered. I don't want anybody to have have a super cool voice and totally blow us out of the water. No so. doubt. Yeah, that, that <laughs> Kenny Rogers barroom kind of voice. Right. Yeah, that's that's all we need. Oh, that's all we need. Comics um, in the stream. That's oh what we God. are. That'd be awesome. <laughs> No, no, moving on. Uh, Cross Gen Tales, number one, Marvel is producing. Uh, when I originally saw this solicitation in previews, I was like, oh, sweet. They're doing an anthology. New stuff, yeah. And I was like, oh, why am I stupid? It's not. It's a no. reprint. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, I, I think I think this is one of those, hey, we're afraid of losing the right, so we need to print something. Mm -hmm. And so here you go. I would take advantage of that. Um, if you've never read cross gen, um, I'm a diehard cross gen fan from day one, actually probably before day one. Like I remember, I remember the wizard ad that was looking for artists for cross gen and like, no one knew what it was. They thought it was like an art studio. No one knew what it was. 
Um, and then Brandon Peterson got in there and became like the art director and all this. Anyway, so uh, I'm a big, big time cross gen fan. So these particular books uh, that's going to be covered in this is going to be Mystic number one, uh, Sigil number one, Sojourn number one, and Ruse number one. Now, Mystic, Sigil, uh, the two of them are two of the original, like, four that launched the the line. Uh, Scion is the other one that had Jim Chung doing the artwork on it. Beautiful stuff. And then the other one was Meridian, which is the first time anyone saw published work by Joshua Middleson. Middle, Middleton, excuse me. Um, so... And his and that art is so much different than what you see his cover art is now, um, but it was still really good, really really good. Um, and then Ruse was a series that sort of came out much later. It says two thousand one, but for some reason it felt like it was longer than that. But time moves differently in my world, I guess. Either way, I would recommend picking this stuff up. Uh, it's uh, a nine dollar book you get four it's one two three four issues um to give it a shot try it out uh i know marvel has other trade paperbacks of some of the other series available so you can you know try it out i'm sure maybe your local comic shop might have them in the dollar bin somewhere um you know whatever but i think it's a pretty good introduction to to what that universe was like uh i really would love for marvel to you know do you know an omnibus of each series i mean they only ran most of them ran 20 to 30 issues at the most some of the early stuff so i think you could put 30 issues into a big omnibus or something like that it's just whether or not it would sell i think folks my age would buy it it would sell yeah i mean so it's i think they definitely get their money back um, but you know, I would shoot if you just put in, you know, a nice little, uh, like a masterwork hardcover or something like that, you know, 10 issues or something like that. I think it would sell well, but that's just me, but it is, it's good stuff. And if you, and if you're younger and you may have missed out on this, I think this is something you should definitely check out. So if you, uh, like those, most of those books are available brand new. Uh, for two to three bucks uh, an issue at most. Yeah. Now you can go to eBay and probably swing, you know, larger swaths of, oh, of yeah. books yeah. for less than that averaged out. But if you, you know, wanted to buy new individual issues, only run you two to three bucks a book if you like it. Yeah. And I've looked. They're they're out there. Trust me. It's oh, yeah. not. They're not hiding by any stretch. And they're not prohibitively expensive no a couple no. of the number ones are you know five to ten an issue there's that but, one issue of mystic um that is the quote-unquote harry potter first appearance in comic um where there's a bar scene and they did as a goof it, and this that's what the story is it's a goof to see how long it would take disney to find out or not disney um who produced or who was the who made the harry potter movies I um but whoever it was to see how long it would take them to find out and it took them forever to find out that they that so so that particular book goes for you know 20 or 30 bucks or something like that warner um, brothers but the rest the rest of the books are pretty close to cover price so yeah i didn't even know that was a thing until recently so oh thank Crazy. you Stephen. yep steven's on top of it trying to yep. try to do the executive i've never watched thing. a single movie i've never <laughs> read a <laughs> single either. novel I, either have i um the only thing i know about harry potter now is that the author is uh not popular with a micro minority that is uh, currently attempting to rule the world from what it looks like but uh, <laughs> That's neither here nor there. <laughs> All right. Uh, my next pick is from Image Comics. It's a trade paperback of the first five issues of Twig by Scotty Young. It's been a very fun, very pretty series to read and to look at. 
uh, entertaining for the soul and very nourishing for the eyeballs. Uh, so those two things together make a trade paperback kind of a no-brainer. Uh, oh, for, for sure. Yeah. And and it, it continues. Uh, one, the, the five issues was not the end of it. So, yes, Doug, uh, it, Doug it's just, it. it's been so much fun. It, it's so... Um, fantastical, which is a funny thing to say about comic books, but, you know, par part of it is, is my fault. You know, most of the comic books I read are, are human beings, you know, it's like this, and like mm -hmm. this, you know, it's, it's all, so that's what most of it looks like is, is human and cities and, you know, stuff like that. But, uh, this is not, and it was just, it was so much fun. Um, don't look at it and think that it's a kitty book. It, it wasn't. Um, it, it did have very serious undertones, but, uh, yeah, 17 bucks for five issues or less, you know, depending on where you get it. 17 right. is the, yeah. uh, what, what are the, what are they called? M MSRP? The MSRP. Yeah. MS. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure you could find it for less than that. And if you really want to wait long enough, you can get it, uh, probably ultimately from in stock trades for what, anywhere from 10 to 20% less oh yeah easily is, yeah. is what they usually do so mm -hmm. but yeah excellent book um absolutely no reason to believe that it won't be an excellent trade paperback as well yeah looks good yeah scotty young i mean he's over the last couple of years has really come out to be um a really good writer like he knows and he mm -hmm. works with solid artists that understand sort of the 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 storytelling that he's trying to put across like right. and it's and i say it would be easy to have him just kind of draw it himself you know or whatever and it's not i mean his his style is uh something that would take you know takes him a lot of time to do mm -hmm. and so yeah he's not to able get to get as much out there as possible you know that he would like to get out there but um but yeah he does he definitely gets gets artists on board that uh that really help put his put his stories across very well so good stuff he he seems to be uh, a, a big fan of the much more uh, fanciful kind of writing too i've yeah. noticed when yeah. when he writes it's yeah yeah it's good stuff man i've i actually missed out on this and so this is definitely a trade that is piquing my interest that i want to go check out so. it should it'll it'll be a nice you know, pretty laid back, easy read five mm -hmm. issues. It'll be entertaining. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed it. I read it issue by issue and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, another image book uh, that is coming out is Bitterroot, the omnibus hardcover. Um, I picked up the series. I picked up most of the series. Um, I picked it up on a whim. Um Walker and Brown and uh, Green were at Heroes Con, not Heroes Con, at Heroes Aren't Hard to Find, the, the store, the folks that do Heroes Con. Uh, when I was working in Charlotte, just walked into the store one day after work just to pick up my books. And the, you know, they've got, if you've ever been in that store, in the very back, they have sort of this display case that's sort of a uh, like a U shape and, and whatever they do. Uh, signings and stuff. I mean, this was the first signing that I'd seen at the store, but they have them sit back there. And so they, I walked back there just to see what was going on because Shelton was back there talking to him. And, and at the time Shelton and I would kind of pay, hey, how's it going kind of conversations. And so I walked back there just to say hello. And, and they had a bunch of books sitting out there, first issues in this particular series. I think the first issue had four or five variant covers to it. So anyway, we got talking and I was like, sure, I'll give it a shot. And, you know, and, you know, me, I'm a big variant cover fan. So, uh, they, I picked up all the covers that they had plus, a uh, South Carolina comic-con variant that they had and they all signed them for me and everything. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. So I got home and I kind of put it on my desk and I'm like, I'll get to that at some point. And, uh, I just remember reading it, you know, one night, like a couple days later. And I was like, holy crap, why was I just sitting on this, not reading this? Um, and then picked up, like I said, most of the series. I, I missed out on the um, the last two or three for some reason. So I've never read the, the finale to it. Um, but Ooh. this omnibus sort of well, like, oh, crap, I need to get on the ball and get this thing read. But it is a 
really well written, uh, beautifully drawn uh, comic. So this omnibus, I'm looking forward to to seeing what it looks like and and hopefully hopefully finding it a little cheaper than 60 bucks. Cause you know, I got, I got, I got things I got to do and 60 bucks is a little pricey for me, but you know, we'll see. It's a good book. Did you ever read this? Uh, I read the first um, handful, five mm-hmm. or six issues. And then I just dropped off of it for some reason. I'm not really sure why. Um, it's not because I didn't like it or anything like that. Right. I, I'm not sure what happened. But I enjoyed it, and yeah. and I agree, and and a lot of people have agreed in that it has won multiple Eisners. Yep. So apparently, you are you are uh, popular in your assessment. Very so cool. Let's see. Oh yeah, and, and Doug's right. Those guys are really nice too. Oh yeah, it was, and that was the thing. The I I think I said like I asked maybe a couple questions about the book or whatever. But the stories that those guys got into and just sort of how they were, uh, um, you know, joking with one another and everything. It was it was a lot of fun to hang out with them and at the shop and 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 hear about just stories of the industry and just stuff like that. But, yeah, super nice guys, too. All right. What is this? All right. My next pick is Quick Stops, written by Mr. Kevin Smith. It's a four issue a series of stories that are going to be set in the view askew universe. So um, this premiere issue, it says um, someone tells a story that um, involves him interacting with Jay and silent Bob in a, in a uh, dinner setting. He's talking to somebody. So, um, I, I, I like almost everything Kevin Smith has done in his view of Skew universe. Oh um, yeah. yeah. One movie I didn't really dig, but other than that, I've, I've enjoyed everything. I haven't seen clerks three yet though. No, I not yet. Yeah. I need to get that done. I've heard good stuff. Yeah. From those who have seen it. So, and this is just, this is another entry in a, uh, uh, yeah, a, an imprint uh, that Kevin has set up at Dark Horse. Yeah, um, that that is a series of things that Dark Horse did fairly recently, as they were <clears throat> losing a lot of rather uh, big properties. Um, <laughs> they were doing other things to make up for it, and one of them was an imprint for Kevin Smith. One was an imprint for Mister Stan Sakai. Mm-hmm. Uh, another was an imprint for Mister. Uh, Goon and uh, Eric Powell. Yes, yep. he he got an imprint, and it seems like there was uh, the um, Bendis. Isn't that where Bendis went? That's Dark, yeah. Bendis is there too. Dark yeah. Horse, so he has mm-hmm. his own imprint there. So that's you know, as as they lost these big, long running mega things, they searched out creators rather than properties to yeah. uh, start you know, little corners of the DC universe. And um, I would have to say they, they certainly have pulled together some interesting, interesting things lately. Oh, for sure. For sure. I think they've got um, looking at the last couple of uh, previews. um, Dark horse was always a, like I knew certain books like, yes. Okay. Sort of their usual suspects that i would always go yeah yeah this this is dark horse stuff um now when i look at dark horse i have to spend more time there right yeah because it's it's so different now and like you said the 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 named creators that they have that are sort of um producing all this stuff it definitely makes you kind of pause and spend more time there and then the previous catalogs no that's that's a good thing so this will be interesting. I'm kind of curious about. It. I totally missed this. Hmm. I do love that cover though. That's pretty sweet. Yep. Blunt man and chronic. Yep. All right. Last but not least, uh, I think I would be a sore, uh, a, a very poor fan if I did not bring this up. The Savage Dragon Ultimate Collection hardcover. This is by obviously Eric Larson. So, you know, this year is the 30th anniversary of Image. So there's been a lot of stuff 
going on about you know the the founders and everything like that different different things and whatnot so finally uh eric larson is uh collecting savage dragon in giant hard covers um and i think these are going to be and i'm guessing these are going to be sort of akin to what skybound's been doing with like invincible Mm -hmm. and walking dead and stuff like that so um but this is going to have the um the first mini series it's going to collect um the and it's going to collect the dragon one through five and savage dragon one through eight and then a bunch of extras i would say a bunch of extras i i follow um or i'm part of um eric larson's facebook group or whatever and he said in the last week or so that the like the sketch section to this is like 70 some pages oh my god like he's really going through the archives you know and a lot of his stuff keep in mind a lot of his stuff um years and years and years ago you know got lost to to a house fire Mm -hmm. and so um i'm really curious to see what some of those extras are so um but 40 dollar book comes out the end of november um and they'll just keep you know producing these to collect everything and the series itself is up to like 263 264 now so i mean there's plenty of material in mini series uh especially in the first couple of years there's a lot of mini series and one shots and stuff like that that i'm sure will get collected along the way too so so yeah i'm looking forward to this and uh and adding it to my collection so. that's averaging three dollars a book for just the books yeah i mean wow yeah so so i think it'll be I, I will be curious to see the number of folks that maybe have jumped on a savage dragon or have just never read savage dragon that would grab this book off the shelf you know and pick it up and and this be the one this be the thing that they say okay i'm gonna give this a shot now well, a lot of this stuff is early to mid 90s so gotta kind of i, I would say mind. though that you're you're gonna run into basically two people either the hardcover collectors mm-hmm. or the old school fans right. I, this doesn't strike me as something the youngins would plunk down 40 bucks to to buy um sight unseen unknown yeah yeah property. and and this yeah. is well it's it's not only that but you know well i've been reading it since 200 mm-hmm. okay uh, even folks like that i don't necessarily see as dipping back to get back issues that's you know everything that i've been seeing and reading it's us gray beards that are <laughs> doing most of the back issue buying right. lately yeah. you know it's it the the young bucks just don't seem to be interested in in that concept it, it just you know it's where they start forward they don't care about before right which i in in a, a sequential story i can't imagine how that can exist that way but Oh yeah, and if you're unaware, I mean that's the thing about Savage Dragon is that every issue is chronological. It is a long form storytelling. Mm-hmm. So time so when there are times where the book for whatever reason wasn't being published on a monthly basis, then if it let's say it would go a year without being published, Larson would go in and sort of fast forward the story which is not ideal for him you know much less the reader but he wasn't a huge fan of it but he had to get the book caught up right to whatever the current time period was yeah. so so yeah so you'd get a few issues that were like that and they were you know kind of interesting you know like how many nine panel pages can you make or how many 16 <laughs> panel pages can you make yeah, yeah no doubt that yeah. kind of thing but but still it, it was you know he had a story he had to set, you know, tell. And so, you know, the Savage Dragon that you see on the cover here, it's not the same Savage Dragon that is currently in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's even a third Savage Dragon that is currently in the book um, that is the, we'll say he's the original dragon. So that dates back all the way to graphic fantasy. So, or 
yeah graphic fantasy Graf- yeah graphic yeah. fantasy almost i was like graphic illustrated that's not right no that's a, no. that's a that's frank Frazetta. so um but yeah so these are all the books uh that we're recommending that we're going to be checking out and things like that for foc uh, again that's october 3rd check with your local retailer as you know to figure out when they submit theirs so you can make sure to get all your stuff in so that being said, we'll switch over to stuff that's coming out next week. Um, that's uh, coming up the October 5th. That's two days after FOC. So so what you got on your list, sir? This um, is not so much as a recommendation, uh, being that it is the final issue of this series. That is the but, best recommendation in the world. But hey, more, you know that book you hadn't read yet? Here's the yeah, last really. <laughs> uh, it, It's more an acknowledgement that this really good book is putting out its final issue yeah. uh, more than anything else. So uh, Basilisk, been following it since the beginning. Uh, it has been very good since the beginning. It is... This property has gone a long, long way to making Cullen Bunn one of my favorite uh, favorite writers at this yeah. point. So this is the final issue. Um, and I think it's like the final issue, final issue. Uh, I yeah, don't I think, think so. there's like a, uh, a season two planned. That doesn't mean he couldn't come up with it. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, uh, it's not, I think, in the works to do that right now. So, mm-hmm. you know, other properties he's done like uh, Empty Man. Um, I believe there was further things that he already had in his head that he could do when the first volume ended, and it just took a little while to get the opportunity to do it. Yeah, I don't. I reading his newsletter. I don't necessarily think that's the case with Basilisk. I believe the twelve issues is the story he had in mind, and that's that. I'm just happy we got the 12 issues. Yes. I remember when that first arc ended, you and I both were like, no, no, we that want can't some be more. All. <laughs> There's yeah. got to be more to it. So Yeah. Fortunately there was, uh, but now, now it's like, oh, is that, yeah, that, yeah. that looks like all. Dang it. So, but yeah, it'll be enjoyable. I'm sure for those of us who've been reading it the whole time. So, but yeah, definitely looking forward to this issue. Um, my first pick is Night of the Ghoul that'll be out next week. This is a Dark Horse book. Um, it is Scott Snyder and Francesco Francavilla. Um, this is one of Scott Snyder's uh comicsology originals that came out last year. And uh, as some of you may, you know, if you're keeping up with that, um, Dark Horse is publishing all of those. So this is just the next in line. So the this series, this mini series, six issues, wrapped up, I think, earlier this year, like I think April or something like that. So so now the series will be out in um you know in hard copy. So we can check it out. Now, if you've got you know Amazon Prime, <coughs> excuse me, always gets me choked up when I talk about Prime. <coughs> It always wants me to, you know, it always thinks I'm going to talk bad about it, but it's not true. Uh, if you've got Amazon Prime, you can check out um, all of his, you know, comics originals or comicsology originals for free. So if you're, you know, if you want to jump on the website and, you know, do that, I mean, there's that. So uh, I did that with a couple of his books and I'm such a, I'm, I'm blind is part of it. Um, the glasses don't help. Uh, don't let that fool you. Uh, so I need the book in front of me and in my hand, very tactile old person, if you will. And so, uh, plus it's Francesco Francovilla. So I kind of feel like I need to have the book in my hand because his art is awesome. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to, to picking this up next week. Oh, there we go. I was like, where, where's your next book? There it is. All right. Now, um, I'll, I'll admit, uh, this week's, um, FOC was, or, uh, not FOC, uh, this week's coming out, uh, was a little, little difficult for me or next week's coming out. Uh, not as many things of interest this particular week. Yes. Frank Avia is, he has been amazing. I think I first saw him in conjunction with a Steve Bryant, Athena Voltaire flip book. 
Oh yeah, with um, was it Beetle, Black Beetle, something like that, something like yeah, that, Black that, Scarab. Yeah, that. Uh, but I, I know I what think you're talking about. It was, uh, but yeah, I think, and that's been so many years ago that it's difficult for me to conjure up that memory. To be, and that was Comic you. Geek Speak that got us, got at least pointed me in Steve that direction. Bryant? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have, I have voraciously consumed anything Steve has put out. It's, yep. it's unfortunate the ongoing tribulations with uh, action labs that's preventing him yeah. from pushing more Athena out there because it's a, it's an excellent, excellent property. Anyways, um, tough for me to, to find books. Um, this and my third pick uh, for the week are more an homage uh, to someone involved in the creation of the materials. Uh, more so than the materials themselves. There is nothing wrong with the material. Uh, this one, for instance, back issue, I, I buy every month and I read. Uh, I am unfortunately about 20, uh, yeah, about 20 issues behind right now. Uh, the editor for this and the editor for my third pick, uh, unfortunately, recently came out indicating that he had diagnosis of terminal cancer. Uh, his name is Michael Yuri. He has been a mainstay of product for tomorrow's for as long as I can remember. Um, he is directly involved in two of their periodical magazines and potentially a third, which I should have looked up, but I, I neglected to. Uh, this is one of them, Back Issue Magazine. This magazine is devoted to comic books of the 80s, whether it be companies, characters, storylines, comics themselves, creators that were prominent or came to prominence then, just anything that you can imagine having to do with comic books in the 80s. Over the nearly 140 issues, a uh, back issue has covered most all of it. Articles, um, unpublished art, um, just it, it's a very uh, mainstay type of magazine in my reading right now because the, the articles can cover any number of things. The art is reproduced beautifully. Uh, there's editorials. There's just any kind of article that you can think of uh, will show up g given enough time. You know, it, they don't have the same style articles in every issue, but over, you know, five or six issues, Every type of article that you can think of will come out in, in that time frame. So uh, it's definitely excellent if you are a history study kind of person and you do something like, say, a uh, podcast where you talk about a particular series issue by issue. Yeah. Um, what is that called? Index. There we go. An index yeah. show. Um these these are invaluable for talking about perhaps the issue if it came out in the eighties the creators you know things like that get background information and and things like that much more readily honestly than um, looking it up sometimes even plain English Google it's a little difficult to find stuff and on top of that I will say that I uh, have acquired a one hundred and twenty issue index for the articles in back issue magazine nice um, so it's up to almost 140 so that index is a little lagging and actually uh, i've been thinking about sitting down when i read those issues and just updating my copy of the index myself um i found it online and i forget where it was i believe it was a it it, it was fan produced it's not produced by them mm. uh, which you can ask uh terry she sat while I was up on my bully pulpit about this uh, <laughs> recently. Most of the fan magazines that have come out, there is not an index available for them right. anywhere. Yeah. How, how that can be done in the publishing process just blows my mind. But there, there is no, I even asked for um, comic buyer's guide. And it would have been um, Maggie, Margie, Maggie Thompson. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I tweeted her and asked if there was a, an article index for that publication. And she said, no, not to her knowledge. Hmm. And I was like, comic buyer's guide. I mean, like at one point that was the pinnacle of, uh, news coverage of the comic book industry, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. And, or is that the one, is that the one that's still going? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, it's, it's not, it's not the one that's still going. It was, um, oh, okay. another one that, um. I think David Anthony Kraft took over for a little while. Mm. I may be mixing up my, but anyways, Maggie Thompson was an editor for a long, long time for a magazine. And I asked her about it and even she didn't have a, an index to articles. And so I I was like, that's just alter ego. Uh, It's still going, no, no index for it. I've asked for it back issue other than this one that I found, which was fan produced, no official indexing of, of it. And yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, but Michael Yuri support him while he's still here. Um, we've seen a lot of really important people go recently and, you know, maybe we've missed our chance to do something. Uh, now you have an opportunity much as we did with Mr. Perez. Um, we have an opportunity knowing that there is a, there is a terminus uh, on the horizon uh, support what he does. He's an excellent editor. He's an excellent article writer, excellent creative for ideas. Uh, just, yeah, look him up on tomorrow's website. Just buy everything that he has because it's all really, really good. Yep. Let's see. Doug, I read Comic Buyer's Guide way back when we all did. That's the thing. And it's some, you know, and the thing is, I used to have a comic shop that would put a copy of um, Comic News. And that was a Comic News, it's not a Comic News. Yeah, it was Comic Uh, Buyer's Guide. Okay. Yeah. But would put a copy of that in just in your bag when you bought books. So. Oh, that was the little newspaper. Yeah, the little newspaper. Comic News Insider. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. So it was. For some reason, I was thinking that was a podcast name. Um, Yeah, I think. Maybe it is too. Um, that's the one that's got uh, Joe, or it was yeah. started by Joe and um, uh, Dudleo. Yeah, I can't think of his exactly. Name. Yeah, Dudleo. Yeah, no, but I know, I know who you're talking about Comic yeah. Shop News is the publication. Comic Shop News. That's what I was saying. That's about. it. Yeah, nice little newspaper. Yep. Uh, eight six eight page. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, so my next book is uh, over at Dynamite. It is Unbreakable Red Sonia number one. This is uh, written by Jim Zubkovich uh, of the uh, good Lord. He's written a ton of stuff at this point. Um, yep, Steven's got them right there. Joe and Jimmy. Jimmy Aquino. Yeah, Jimmy Aquino. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, uh, one one of the O G comic mm-hmm. book podcast i think they are uh legitimately in like the first five. Oh yeah Easily. comic news insider yeah, yeah they've been around for a very long time um art on this is done by giovanni uh Vitella, or oh excuse me valetta and the cover this particular cover is by um uh perillo uh who does a ton of really good uh covers for dynamite so um i was luckily enough i've already had an opportunity to read this particular issue dynamite sent me a preview copy of it um and uh i was it's one of those things i'm I'm gonna buy it folks i'm gonna pick it up but um but yeah after checking out this preview copy that i got uh i any excitement that i had for the book um was confirmed uh by reading the preview copy um the art in it is superb um it is a fun um you know sword and sorcery book you know that jim's up you know is known to write and uh there is a nice twist in it um that i guess i should have seen coming and i probably saw it coming went nah he's not gonna do that and then i read it and i got to the end of the book i'm like oh he did do that oh okay cool you know and so it was one of those nice reveals um 
I'm, you know, I'm a long time Red Sonja fan. Love what Dynamite's been doing, uh, doing with the character of the creators that they uh, have been able to bring on board to sort of to to tell all the stories that they can of Red Sonja uh, from from her being, um, a, you know, just the warrior to being the queen uh, to even uh, in this particular one, uh, the story of her being uh, when she was young. Uh, the and discovering you know sort of who taught her to be who she is now uh so it's a lot of uh a lot of great stories and this is you know so far this first issue is definitely uh right on you know right on par with all those things so so if you've been you know curious about red zone you want to check out something i would recommend this uh this series check out this first issue and see if it's something that you enjoy okay i'm going to jump in here and say Store variants notwithstanding. Oh no, you're gonna count all those? 25, Chris. Yeah, I saw them. They they had so many that they ran through the alphabet. You know how we talk about cover A, <laughs> cover B, cover C. The final one was a cover Z A. So oh, they went geez. all the way through the alphabet and had to start over. I'm I'm scrolling. Oh dear lord. Yeah. Not I'm... counting store variants, which there if there's this many publisher variants there has to be store variants on this so uh for those of you keeping score so, at home here are all on the screen here are all the very covers. yeah that is just the list of There's unbreakable Z-A red right sonia there. yeah z and then z a i was like what so yeah dynamite yet again leading the pack oh, keeping man. the variant cover industry in business right there okay so all right Let's take a little time with this since you brought it up. Okay, I'm so, let's, I'm let's so happy that. you did. I'm sure so happy thing. you did. So the annoyance that I get, I love a black and white sketch cover. Yes. So I love those. Don't get me wrong. So, uh, but I don't need. Okay, so we've got the we've got the David Finch black and white variant. That's cool. Uh, Finch is superb writer, writer artist. Um, I don't need whatever this is. The ver- oh, the Virgin variant, which just means there's no logo on it. No logo, right? Okay. The Virgin variants are always a thing. I'm just like, I just don't care. Um, but I thought I saw a third one. Uh, yeah, the David Finch fiery red variant. Does that just mean it's a red cover? Uh, I, I probably. Know. You, but, you, but, that's what it is. You know, it is. <laughs> but you think every cover is tailor made for one black and white. Oh yeah. One yeah. virgin and one with the with the book's logo on it. So right there's three covers for every one picture. Yep. And then you get the uh Augusta Moore cosplay variant and of course you've got to have the virgin variant of that. Right. And yes. then there is a I thought I saw another one. Here's uh, here's a tinted variant. A tinted oh god yeah the the H cover is is a the the variant. blood red blank authentics variant I, I, I yeah I what is that I yeah I have no idea oh uh, yeah I'm so happy you brought that up that is now so the, the cosplay for both uh, Red Sonia books and the Vampirella books sometimes are pretty interesting because typically they're different uh, different women doing yeah them. it's yeah. not the same woman that you constantly see so yeah. it's interesting to see how much into the costume they get, you know, oh, yeah, how the, sure. the different, and, and these are, these are major cosplayers. These are, are women that will show up at conventions yeah. uh, doing yeah. this. And, and actually uh, some of them do it for a living. Yeah. They get, they get paid to appear as, you know, certain characters. And if you follow on Instagram, um, so you obviously dynamite, you know, pays for the the licensing, the rights to publish a Red Sonia comic. And so um, the lady whose actual name escapes me, but she's the one that owns the rights and uh, runs the um, Red Sonia, the official Red Sonia Instagram page and everything. A lot of the cosplayers and even some of the cover art and stuff like that, that eventually make it to um, to the books she's scouring Instagram oh, and, for and these people. I mean, she, it is first. active. She's yeah. super active. Now, they're currently filming the Red Sonja movie. 
So she's at the set. She's doing oh, those kind of, yeah. Oh yeah. There's that. a movie. Oh, for sure. Oh. They started filming within the last week or two. Oh, cool. So she's, she's been, you know, not showing you behind the scenes stuff, but letting you know, Hey, I'm at the set and showed some of the um, actors and stuff that are involved and, you know, those kind of things, folks who I'm not very familiar with, but I think that's actually a good thing. I think not having a huge name uh, on the movie is beneficial. Uh, Steven, man, again, thank you very much for all your help, buddy. And you have a, have a good evening as you sleep. (laughs) But yeah, so yeah, there's the, the Red Zone movie is in, is being filmed right now. I, I am a fan and will always be a fan of perhaps the original Red Sonja cosplayer, Wendy Peeney. I was going to say Wendy Peeney, yeah. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you know, th- this is this is way back in the mid 70s. Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah, she uh and I don't know, did we talk about that here or did I talk about it? On yeah, the, we've talked about it here. Here, I, talk about ElfQuest I think too. we've mentioned it on Steven's show that I co-host with him too. But yeah, it's uh, her and Frank Thorne. Yep, for sure. All right, uh, my next pick is another Michael Urey book from Tomorrow's Publishing, Team Up Companion. Uh, and it's looking at comic books of the Silver and Bronze Age where characters teamed up, such as the uh, ever-popular Brave and the Bold, for DC. Marvel is Marvel Team Up and Marvel 2 and 1, but there are other books that there have been through the Silver and Bronze Ages where superheroes team up, and those will be books that he covers in this as well. Um, Brave and the Bold, Marvel Team, you know, Brave and the Bold has a podcast, and I believe that is the only one of those team up books that does. Um, hmm. Superman, or DC Comics Presents, there it is. Um, that had a podcast, uh, but he covered all the books. So it's <laughs> I'm done. What point. do I do yeah. now? <laughs> uh, the Brave and the Bold is currently running. And I think uh, the one of the dudes that used to do the Fantastic Cast brought it back. Oh, okay. And I believe the Fantastic Cast covered two and one because that's got Ben Grimm in it. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anybody at all doing Marvel Team Up. It's a not, bunch not of, that a I can bunch think of books the to talk about that. Top of my head. Well, but it's Spider Man. Yeah. Well, it's Spider Man, but was it always? Ju- it wasn't always just Spider Man, though, was it? I, yeah, yeah, because I, I guess because Thing was in t- two and one. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I think it's always been Spider Man and yeah, whomever. Yeah, because every 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 book that I'm thinking off the top of my head, I'm like, yeah, Spider Man, X Men, Spider Man, Daredevil. It, yeah. Spider-Man. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, like, you're, you're right. I think DC Comics Presents was always Superman and. Mm-hmm. Brave and the Bold was not always Batman and. Right. So um, I think everybody else was, for the entire run, the one co-host and a rotating cast. So, yeah. But uh, another good uh, example of the type of material that Michael Yuri wants to publish. Uh, yeah. This one, 32 bucks for... Uh, where did I see that? Up here? No, I don't see it anywhere. I'm not sure how many pages are in this. Probably a couple hundred. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the um, the 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 Roxon, not the Roxon, the lab storyline where uh, the thing teamed up with people for that Marvel Energy Lab that Quasar was head of security for. Oh, that storyline. Uh, it wasn't Roxon. I no, I don't believe it's Roxon. It's something no. else. Doug, who 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 is the energy uh, investigating organization that Quasar was head of security for? They'll get back to us in a few minutes. Yeah, I forget who it was. I want to say Star Labs, but that's DC. That's DC. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. While he's looking at that, I will jump into my last book. This is Project Earth Pegasus. Divers. Oh, there we go. was it Project Pegasus? Oh, Pro- okay. Project well. Pegasus. Yes. Oh, I knew them through Hulk. Oh, okay. well, there you go. Yeah. Should I should have picked up on that? Um, Earth Divers number one. This is from IDW. This is written by Stephen Graham Jones, uh, David uh, Gian. Felice, Gian, Gian Felice, wow, Gian Felice, David Gian Felice. 
Apologize and for that. Rafael Albuquerque. But this is the um, this is the story of um, in two thousand. I love this year. There's so many books that use that year. Uh, but twenty one twelve uh, apocalypse is exactly as expected, and everything's dying. Uh, so uh, some indigenous survivors find a time traveling portal in a cave and decide to go back in time to uh, kill Columbus. So uh, I think we talked about this when it was in previews. Yeah, and I believe it was I've sort of stuck yeah. stuck in my head since. Uh, with it coming out next week, I wanted to sort of remind everybody that it was there. And if I can find a copy of this book on the shelf, I will definitely be picking it up because I am very curious. Yeah, that, that's an um, interesting this premise is. there. Yeah. Interesting. And and it's one of those things, you know, like we've talked about before, um, both on the show and off, that uh, I am kind of getting into the point where I need to read some very unique premises. Mm-hmm. Uh, time travel is fine. I mean, that's not a thing. I mean, I, you see it all the time, quote unquote, see it all the time. But the premise of the time traveling right, is something interesting. And this is interesting. And I'll pick it up. So. I am on board. So, all right, let me get us switched around here to talk about our preview books. Uh, just give me, give me, give me a second. Let's see. Uh, I wanted to do something else, but it's not going to work. So we'll just, we'll just go with this. Add to the stream. All right. This is my first pick. I got my copy of the Frank Miller Presents Ash Can in my most recent, uh, where did I get this? Westfield Comics, I think, order. It's got two stories in it, uh, which will uh, be their first two ongoing books. Uh, There is ads in it for, uh, I think, two more stories, um, uh, additional uh, books as well. Uh, but this, I, I'm 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 not going to go into I'm not going to go into great detail who Frank Miller is. I think a lot of people listening know who Frank Miller is. Honestly, if you don't know, look it up because there's more to Frank Miller than I could take the time to. I was say, I mean, that is a series of podcasts in itself. Fra- Frank Miller could quite easily be on someone's uh, comic creator Mount Rushmore. That's yeah. that's how big a deal Frank Miller has been. Yep. Uh, but what caught my eye in particular of his imprint and also the sash can is this follow-up to Ronan, uh, the young lady here at the top. Uh, Ronan was an 80s. Oh, yeah. You're, okay, Doug. I, I see He's a funny guy. There. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to provoke me. I will not be provoked, Doug. <laughs> I, will, I will not. Um. Uh, one of his big uh, DC, right, Chris? That's who he did that for, wasn't it? Ronan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's that's one of the books that Frank Miller used to make his mark uh, among many others over the course of his career. But this is this is a, uh, a, a touchstone series for Frank Miller, Ronan. This is the follow-up, uh, the first follow-up that there's been. So it's almost... 40, it's getting close to 40 years, 35 to 40 years since the original came out. And now he's getting around to uh, publishing a follow-up to it, a sequel, if you will. It involves, uh, th- this is a, a very, and and this is very typical of Ash Cans. Uh, we, we talked about these a little while back, I think, because we pulled this out of previews also. Um, an Ash Can is usually one of a couple or, or, or maybe three concepts. And one of the concepts is multiple just teasers of what is going to be a book coming out in the near future. And that is what this is. Another um, possibility for an ash can is a partial or whole printing of an upcoming issue maybe with a little change in format. Maybe it's in black and white rather than color, or uh, it's in a different color. It's all silver or, you know, stuff like that. Something to make it different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 
I think a lot of times the original ash cans were just a teaser of what they were going to do, not giving away really anything that was actually in the upcoming comic book. Uh, at least this uh, Ronin is. Now, the second one, the, the second story, Ancient Empire, Enemies, Ancient Enemies, that does quite a bit. So it could it could possibly be an excerpt of the book itself. I don't think the Ronin is an actual ep excerpt. I think it's a uh, just the, the briefest little teaser. But we're introduced to probably who is going to be the main individual, and it's the young lady you see here in the top half. And uh, just a, 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 a breath of an experience that she is going through that I'm sure will lead into the ongoing story. Mm -hmm. Now the, the second one, ancient uh, enemies uh, it's, it's a, what, what I call a hardcore sci-fi. Uh, it is extraterrestrial civilizations and space and spaceships and lasers and uh, uh, a war between two planets and, and all of the things that made, um, sci-fi prose such a thing back in the in the 40s and 50s uh that ultimately translated into sci-fi comic books as well because the trope if it works in one it will work in another mm -hmm. medium uh that's that's a proven fact uh but ancient enemies there are two civilizations one in the magellanic cloud and one somewhere else that i didn't even recognize if it actually exists <laughs> or not They've been at war longer than the current people in the story can remember. This is a four-digit year multi-generational war between these two planets. Uh, it's gotten to the point where they have made, and um, I'm, I didn't want to get into detail too much in the in the Ro Ronin story because I definitely want people to read it. Yeah. I don't care if you read Ancient Enemies or not; <laughs> it'll be good. But. Um, and it's gotten to the point where these two civilizations are almost at, at the end of their ability to do anything. They've exhausted their resources. Mm -hmm. The people are uh, in dire straits and or revolting. I mean, th this is it. So they, they make an agreement after thousands of years of fighting each other. They make an agreement. One more. One more battle. One ship, oh, one person, it will decide everything. And uh, they are to meet in neutral territory so that there is no advantage. Everything is set up so that there is no advantage. Everything occurs at the same time. The ships leave the planets. They enter uh, some sort of dimensional a Heisenberg tunnel, whatever that's called, to, to get to the neutral site at the same time. I mean, everything is done so that nobody has an advantage. The two champions that are picked, both, when they're told how things will occur, object because it is completely contrary to any sort of battlefield honor. The civilizations are both of the opinion that winning at any cost is what matters. Honor be damned, in essence. Hmm. Well, these two individual warriors are completely against that. So they they um, subdue the men who were supposed to fight the battles. The two ships, as they are being rested of control by the pilot and the civilization uh, in charge. They both lose control and they crash together. These two ships crash to modern Earth. So we were the site of the neutralness. Mm. And the story starts with several different people seeing the two ships, and, and they have... Uh, crashed together. So all of this stuff will be mixed up of these two civilizations. So theoretically, you will have access to advanced technology from two different civilizations in the same place, where the, wherever it crashes. Yeah. Um, 
different people see the crash. And, and so I'm sure that the story is going to involve individual people from individual types of life, walks of life on earth, going to this uh, crash site to do something, maybe help the aliens, maybe get some of the tech, maybe get, you know, who knows, but that yeah. is the genesis of, of where the story is going to, to go as far as Earth's involvement. Now, keep in mind, this is all contemporary. So you still have these two um, alien civilizations that will be interested in getting their stuff back because of how important it was to begin with. So there will be that aspect of the story, too. So there are there are three civilizations. Well, if you can call Earth a civilization, I don't necessarily know that that's fair. Um, and two extraterrestrial civilizations all coming together in this one story. And that one story is going to be from Frank Miller uh, to boot. So, you know, it's going to have some some pretty high weirdness. Some oh, pretty, yeah, for sure. Uh, deep themes, some some thinky kind of themes, political themes, uh, societal themes. All of this is going to be represented in the story in some way. Um, if you can see it, it's going to be there. It's just a matter of whether you recognize it or not. Because right. that's that's how Frank Miller writes. That's how he's always written. So very, very high concept, very multi-layered high concept. So if if you only want to go about halfway up in in what he's trying to do, fine. You'll be entertained. If you don't want to go anywhere and just read it for what you see, fine. You'll be entertained. If you want to try to pick everything, you know, (laughs) just whatever you want to do with the writing, it'll be that deep um, to to hold your interest on whatever level you, you consume comic books on. So yeah. Frank Miller, go get it. Yep. Ancient uh, enemies, but go get Ronan also. Yeah. I, and I, while you were talking, I looked up cause I knew Ronan. I mean, Ronan came out like in 84. Okay. So, so it was a six issue bidding series. I was looking at the trade paperbacks. Trade paperbacks are in at least their seventh printing. So it is a book that is widely, read and purchased or purchased and read let's put it in the right order hopefully that's it's in that order and uh, <laughs> that also makes it a book that dc doesn't want to let go of because they know they can continue to make money on it yeah for sure watchman so uh, well, yeah. well yeah comes yeah. to mind yeah that's number one uh ronin is number two there so mm, yep but yeah good stuff yeah, I'm glad you got that. I I wanted to pick up a copy, but none of my shops even picked up the second issue or the second print of the Ash Can. So, huh, like, oh. that's that's interesting. Okay. Well, it's it's well, let's let's correct let's correct that. Of the ones that I went to, none of them had it. Doesn't mean well, none of them had it out on the shelf. Let's put it that way. Doesn't mean they didn't. Doesn't get mean it. they didn't get it. But you yeah, know, not gotcha. a lot of people were buying the second issue, what or second print. Who cares? Whatever. Um, I'll eventually pick up Ronan too, regardless. So um, my first book is the roadie. Number one, this is from dark horse. It is written by Tim Seeley and art by Fran uh, Galan and letter by Ed Torres. Um, so I, I, this book was not even on my radar until let's see. Today's Thursday. It wasn't on my radar until Wednesday. Um, Tim Seeley tweeted something. Uh, I follow him on Twitter. So he was like, Hey, you know, this, this book is out that I did. And I'm like, how did I not know anything about this book? So I was like, all right, well, I'll stop by the shop. If they've got a copy of it sitting on the shelf, I'll pick it up. No doubt. And luckily my shop had a copy of it. Yay. Uh, had a couple of copies of it, which was great. Um, so I only picked up the one. So I want to let other people buy it too. So um, what, so the shop owner said when I was, uh, when he was bringing up my books, he was like, yeah, that, that's a book I, uh, I read this morning um, and wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But when I got to the end of it, I was, I really liked it. I was looking forward to the second issue. I was like, okay. And he's, you know, he's kind of like, he's a little younger than me, I think. Um, 
and but he is um he's got a wide range of tastes when it comes to comics so with him saying that i was kind of okay cool you know if he's if he's in if he's into it that i'm probably going to enjoy it at some some level so uh start reading it it is about this this roadie that he's a very apparently a famous roadie or whatever uh, but he's been travel he traveled in his youth with this one band uh that was always on the cusp of making it big they were always opening up for uh, other big bands and stuff like that. Um, but that, you know, fame and fortune was never his thing. He just wanted to be there with the music and was never looking to get on the stage himself or whatever like that. Um, and then it, you know, so it gives you a little, uh, at the beginning of the book kind of gives you, uh, what his life was like, you know, sort of in the heyday of it all, uh, which was, I'm going to guess probably late seventies, early eighties, um, but it, they never really give you sort of a definitive time frame, uh, which isn't important. So, but then you sort of flash forward, um, and see him in present day, the guy who he was touring with, uh, not quite as popular as it used to be. He's sort of opening up, uh, or, or is, is the headliner for a lot of, you know, like clubs and bars and stuff like that, you know, but he's been, you know, but they're still, you know, still good buddies, you know, still doing it for the music and all that other stuff. So, um, the, the book would have been fine for me. Like I would have probably continued to read into the next issue if it was just that story. I'm a big music guy. I love these kind of like, you know, road stories and stuff like that. Like I'm sure let's do that. But uh, it definitely, there's a twist in it that, um, I mean, it's in, I think it's in the solicitation. Um, so it's not going to ruin anything if you've read the solicitation, but there is a supernatural element to this that I didn't see coming. Um, but I should have seen it in the first few pages. I just wasn't paying that much. Att- I was like, oh, look, cool light show. No, nope, those were demons and whatnot that were being conjured by uh, the lead singer's voice and he was not aware of it. He was, and what the, what ends up happening is that the roadie is the seventh son of a seventh son. Um, And he, his sort of role in it all is uh, to keep the demons at bay. And so, so that's, that's kind of his job. Um, now it's not a big sword and sorcery kind of thing. Uh, there's a, there's a bit of it in the middle that sort of explains, uh, and this will obviously be good for Ed nine because of our ages, but you know, back in the seventies, you know, in the sixties, you know, rock and rolls of the devil and all this other stuff. And this book says they were right. (laughs) They were like, they were right. They were, it was, and that was how the devil was gaining power and strength and and whatnot. And then another demon came along and, and sort of started to entice people with hatred for one another. And the music sort of got lost and all of that. And so uh, the devil or Satan sort of kind of pull back a bit to regroup. And so all of the uh, social discord and everything that had been, uh, going on for the last 20, 30 years or whatever, uh, was because of this one demon. And, uh, apparently, um, the, at first it's said that the devil, uh, had a offspring who is now, uh, I guess of age that their music, they're a singer. And so their music is sort of to bring upon sort of this next age for Satan. And it's up to the roadie to go after them, to either destroy them or protect them, his choice. And there are some consequences for both. And uh, he he's well aware of demons and who lies and who tells the truth and all this other stuff. And so he was very skeptical of it. And, but come to find out that the offspring is not of Satan, it is his and so uh, now he has to decide whether or not he needs to protect his own child or, uh, or destroy them, you know, again, sort of cool, which bound. So it's, 
it is a very interesting take on things. The story, it's definitely nothing of a concept that I've read before. Um, so I am very, very interested in this. Um, Sealy sold me. I'm a fan of his stuff anyway. This is not like anything that I've read of his before, uh, which is um, nice to see sort of a different thing for him. Um, now, Fran Galan's art or Galen's art, incredible. Um, I would buy it solely for the art alone. Um, I'm really happy that they're words and so I can get what the story is. But at the same time, I spent a lot of time um, not even reading it and then going back and looking at it, but I like would read a couple, you know, panels or whatever. And then I would sort of like, look at the art. And then once I realized sort of in the middle of the book, what was going on at the beginning of the book, I flipped back and was like, all right, let me look at this again. And then sort of took, it's just, the art's great. It's amazing. Um, I don't know how many issues this is, but I'm going to cherish every moment of it uh, <laughs> that I get uh, and sort of absorb absorb all this this series so highly recommend it i have a question sure was there any indication of locations that they were traveling to um no because it all seems to be um i mean like um at the end of the book going after his uh offspring they're going to la so okay so we definitely know that do do whatever they want but they can't go down to georgia because CDB is already taking care of that. So I he's mean, already taking care of that. Yeah, true. He, he's already written that story. You can't, you can't besmirch the Charlie Daniels band. So, so at the beginning, the flashback is uh, there at the Whiskey Go Go. So uh, okay. that, so I know exactly. The, uh, but well, other than that, when they get to the present day, as long as story, it's not down in Georgia, they now. don't right. say where it is. Okay, all so. right, fair enough. Fair <laughs> but good enough. point. Very yeah, good. Yeah, it's you know. But look at that. I mean, that cover, I mean, yeah, that cover that, right there is awesome very, um, is a great example of what you find inside. Like it looks a lot. I mean, I can probably, I mean, I let you show the art all the time. I guess I could do that too. Um, so here is a sample of some of the art. Okay. That stuff in the present, that stuff in the past. Got a lot um, of words. It's a lot of words, but don't let that. Uh, I mean, look at this page or this double page. Oh, well, there we go. Okay, not, oh, not look as at many that. Words. Yeah, okay. yeah, that that's some. Yep, that's some good looking stuff. That's nice. So um, looks, looks very atmospheric. And it's a it's an artist who I'm not very familiar with. So I'm I need to do a little research and see if I've actually seen see more of their work in the past. Because if I haven't, I don't why um oh i take it back uh frank galen has worked with cullen bunn uh on after uh aftershocks knights temporal ah okay so i have go. so i've you i've seen, seen i've read a couple issues of that so yeah so yeah. i have seen it so but other than that that's the only mm, that's the only thing that i see uh, that I recognize. Oh, no, did Lucky Devil 2 for Dark Horse, so I've read that. Um, it did, oh, did Rogues for Amigo Comics. I read a couple issues of that, and that's where the El uh, Torres um, link comes in, too, because that's okay. that's his pub publishing thing. So, so, good stuff. Moving right. right along. Next up for me is Dead End Moon Issue 2 from Bad Bug Media via Kickstarter. Uh, Bad Bug is one of my uh, more sought-after Kickstarters. When I keep an eye on everything they do because I've enjoyed uh, a couple of their other books so far. This is written for us by Skucky with art by Gwen Tavares, lettered and designed by Dave Lentz, and created by Alice and Mike Tenner, T-E-N-E-R, Tenner. Um, now, the story is about the young lady there that's in the middle of the cover. Uh, the gentleman to her, what is that, left is a ghost, actually. She is corporeal, but she 
is kind of altered, as you can tell by her shiny red eye that she has there on the uh, right side. It's like Cable's and, daughter? Uh, yeah, no, it's not <laughs> hope. There, there is no hope in this book. Oh, no. But I'm um, Ching, if you'd read the book. but uh, uh, And to the right of her is another corporeal uh, young lady that, okay, the triumvirate here, the story revolves around the girl in the middle who um, every time that she is referenced by the ghost dude, he refers to her with a different name because he's messing with her. Oh, okay. um, so off the top of my head, I forget which one is her real name because he uses it like one out of every six or seven times he refers to her, mm. uh, but uses other words that are names and, and other um, nouns or adjectives at times also. So he, yeah, he's, he's mad at her and he's just messing with her. But she has a link to the supernatural. Her dad, in the first issue, we find out it didn't occur. It occurred well before this. But we find out in the first issue that her dad was killed and she wants revenge. She lived. She wants revenge. She sought the help of a, uh, a universal kind of constant. Uh, you know, kind of like Phoenix uh, mm, from Marvel mm -hmm. Comics, you know, somebody, but not, um, they refer to her as the messenger in this, but she had a name that was given to her to call if she needed help in the first issue. Um, and, and interesting enough, the, the messenger um, rides around in a ghostly carriage wearing, wearing a plague mask that has the big long snout on it mm -hmm. you know the plague mask kind the style oh yeah yeah, yeah um and uh they're they're riding ghostly demon horses or not riding but they're the carriage is being pulled um, mm -hmm. she has a demon horse also because um she asked for help and was granted powers to hunt down the man that killed her father because he was more than human and she realized that uh when she was younger and she saw this individual kill her father. So she asked, you know, those same kind of powers for help. She was granted help with the understanding that, um, you know, there will be a time when I will come to you, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so she has to occasionally take missions hunting supernatural creatures that are on earth and they're not supposed to be whether they have invaded here or they have been conjured here or however they have no place here so the messenger will get her to dispatch the supernatural creatures in between missions to find the killer of her father she doesn't know who it is she doesn't remember she just remembers certain things about this individual hmm. well by the end of this issue she meets the person that killed her father because he comes to help her believe it or not. Um, the ghost is uh, someone that she encountered in the first issue. The girl that is traveling with her is a girl that she rescued in the first issue. And that's why they're all together. Um, the, the art is uh, a little lightly colored, um, kind of on the cartoony side a little bit. Mm-hmm. Not deeply saturated colors, but everything has this kind of hue to it. That, that yeah, I was going to say, it's sort of a grayish, a, or at least gray, that's the way it looks. A gray or a pinkish reddish, just depending on what they're doing. Now, when she remembers back two times with her dad, um, that is natural color. Oh, okay. In here. But everything else seems to have this, this it's off. You know, it's mm -hmm. got this... Uh, offness to it um in this issue she encounters a siren uh, unlike any siren that i've ever seen you know how the the mythological siren sang to the sailors and uh did something that caused their death either they fell into the ocean or some mm -hmm. sirens would eat them or you know something well well in this one the siren uh, the the aspect of the siren that we know 
is much like that little dangly thing in the front of a lantern fish. Oh, really? The, the lure. It's yeah. it's it's a it's a lure, and it's attached to this huge, big, ugly thing. Oh, I, I've never seen a siren drawn like that. It, it was kind of it was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, now the siren, the 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 actual siren is has feminine aspects, but it would not. I would not describe it as a a, a female monster at all. Right. It just has some. Um, appendages that are rather feminine, shall we say? Um, but yeah, the, the the siren attacked one of them, and it was this, you know, hovering female, naked, singing kind of thing. But it was attached like the little light lure on a lantern fish to this much bigger thing. It was mm-hmm. just kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, what happens is the girl that she rescued becomes infected with some mystical evil demony kind of magic and the person that comes to rescue her turns out to be the man who killed the father of the main character oh okay and so he is going to lead them to where the girl can get the help that she needs with the understanding that when this is over, the other girl is going to kill him because that's what she's out to do to begin with. So I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting aspect of the story that Mm -hmm. the person who killed your dad, which we don't know why he did. uh, I would suspect because of what's going on in this issue that it wasn't just a straightforward. I saw him. I don't like him. I shot him kind of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he comes out of the woodwork. Uh, th- they didn't know where he was. They, she was trying to track him, but she really didn't have any substantial leads. Um, and her companion gets infected, and out of nowhere is this dude, you know, who's telling her, uh, "You need to get her help, and I know where you can go. Follow me, and I'll take you there." And she's like, "No, no, no! no. Wait a minute! You killed my dad. Why am I going to do anything other than kill you?" And so they have, you know, this conversation back and forth. And until at the end, it's like, okay, we'll go get her help. And when she gets help, then I'll kill you. Yeah. And meanwhile, you have this ghost that she pissed off that doesn't want to leave her alone um, hanging around also. And the the man that killed her dad, there's something up with him. I, I don't think he's completely in this plane, but I don't think he's completely a creature of another plane either. So I... Right. He he has, I think, some sort of powers, kind of like she does, that's been granted him by uh, an other dimensional entity. Interesting. But good stuff. Bad Ooh. bug. Um, and actually, I'm waiting for another set of books uh, called Black Jackets, I see here advertised, that uh, I haven't gotten caught up on. So... I should be getting those soon. And Under City Tales, I'll have to dig that one out because I have that one in my box. I was looking in my boxes this weekend to see what else. Only cool people are late for comic addiction, though I may be biased. Hi, Hyper. Glad so to have Hyper you. Hyper shows up. He's got the kids finally to bed, so in, he's indeed. decided to join us. So he, he has a he has a mo. Yes. Um so my next book is eight billion genies number five of eight uh i think i, I forgot what issue of this i reviewed um, didn't you talk about one maybe okay was it one okay i, I, remember I thought it was yeah was. the first issue because right. it, it got me interested to read it and i it's it's on my pile right along with all of my uh with with the um other superhero radiant stuff that, black yeah that i was gonna read but i just didn't I, I had to take time this weekend and just read some old X comics to to get my comic mojo back. Hey, I understand, man. You gotta do what you gotta do. The contemporary X just beat it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, getting beat by one X for the other. Mm. Um, that's a it's a whole different thing. Hyper can no, sorry. Uh <laughs> seemed like a thing I could throw at him, but I probably I, who not. knows. We'll see. So, um, so we're five issues in, eight issues to go. At this point, we're eight um, issues to go. Eight, or excuse issues. me, eight issues for the whole series. Three issues to go. Sorry, 
um, brain wanted to go faster than my mouth would allow mm-hmm. me to. So, um, so we only have three more issues. So, um, going into this issue, I knew at some point the, I guess the, the end game needed to be seen. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Just uh, oh, geez. Um, so I put that on the screen too. Geez. Um, so yeah, no, that's not a thing. I think. Um, I knew we had to start seeing where the end goal was. I just didn't realize we were going to get it in this issue, and then what are we going to do with the next three issues, kind of thing. So. The the start of this issue introduces us to uh, a guy who eventually will become known as the Idea Man. And um, A Billion Genies has been so good. Oh, for sure. Um, so hopefully I don't spoil this one for you here, Doug. Um, but so the Idea Man is introduced. And so it takes place, it introduces us in, to him in the 80s. And then sort of shows us his life. He's definitely a guy who is never being taken seriously. He's beat up by bullies. He's just an unfortunate soul. And as soon as uh, the genies appear, um, you know, one, everybody gets one. He immediately, I mean, the genie's like, hey, how are you doing? And then I wish, like, just immediately was like, I wish everyone would take me seriously. And the genie says something along the lines of, oh, this will be fun. you know. <laughs> and so in grants in the wish. Now he is one of the, obviously one of the first people to, t- to make a wish. So his wish, the early, the way it reads is the earlier you take a wish uh, or make a wish, the more precedent it happens because every subsequent wish can't um there are sort of boundaries it can't it can't ruin you can't say well and they give you examples in this book right it, it, affects, can't, can't do. it affects all wishes after yeah and so so there's some limitations after that wish but as you, you know if you've been paying attention to this book the entire world, you know, the, the globe itself is in the shape of a Mickey mouse head at this point. So it's, it's, yeah, that was somebody's wish. Crazy talk that, that has been the funny part of every issue is that first page you get to see, cause it gives you the count. It gives you the population count of the world as far as like people living on it. Then it gives you the genie population count. And then it shows you what the, world from a sort of a satellite view wow. of it looks oh, like okay. and it's in, it's insanity um and, so, and i have no doubt that that is how things would go oh no doubt whatsoever yeah, just no no doubt at all i yeah so so we've got the idea man um so he's there the young kid who um he wanted to protect his parents so he his wish was to be a superhero and so so he is out in the world and he joined he's in subsequent issues he's joined up with other surprisingly other kids who have become you know adult looking superheroes much like shazam or captain marvel or whatever so um so their their journey has led them to uh, the city that the idea man currently lives at. So the, what they've been doing along the way is that the genies have been explaining to everybody when they, cause the genie, cause the genies are there not just to grant the wishes, but to, you know, be interactive, you know, and answer questions when you know, they're not screw you over kind of genies. They, they're pretty, they're, they're pretty, Matter of fact, but at the same time, if you've got a question about, okay, how is this wish going to affect certain things? And they'll kind of explain parameters and stuff like that to you, which is good because that way you're a little more wiser in how you, you know, cast your wish. And they want, you know, people to, to get what they want, you know, not some, you know, screwed over way of doing it. So, so we get a lot of that kind of explanation along the way. 
And and so somebody says, well, why doesn't someone just wish all of this to go back to normal? And that's where the, well, you know, because so many wishes have happened and this, you know, you'd have to be very specific because if this happened, this happens. And then you, you got to be able to sort of take into account your wish that this happens. And, you know, it, it becomes a math problem. Um, what the idea man has done during the eight months that it's been since the genies have appeared is do the math. And at one point in this issue, um, he decides to make his wish. Now I won't go into the details as far as like how he did it, but he has figured out ways to get additional wishes, not from his own genie, but from other people's genies using the genies as basically currency. And so he has other wishes now. And so his wish is to bring everything back to normal uh, or as normal as it can be. And in doing so, he has written out his wish and starts to say it. And apparently it takes hours for him to do it because it is my wish is this taking this into account, taking this into account, taking this into account, blah, blah, blah. And does that for hours. And, you know, sort of at, one point just sort of, you know, the genie says, okay, we got it. You know, we know what you're trying to say and wishes everything back to normal. And so the population is what it is. And, and so everything sort of, sort of, as far as we can tell, kind of goes back to normal. So we'll find more about it in the, in the next issue. Um, but, but yeah, so we're five issues in and, Sort of that redo thing has already happened. Uh, Hyper, you guys would love to see my comic collection if I had a personal G. Jeez, that's tell me. I would have I would have a lot of back issues, only very specific ones though. <laughs> like, give me all the Elf Quest, give me all the anyway. So, give me all the black and white horror stories, you know, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, it just when I got to the end of this issue, I was kind of like, oh, well, now I'm more curious about what the next three issues are going to be about. Now, that being said, everything is not literally back to normal, but it is because the world is still sort of destroyed. But what's going to happen next? So we'll, you know, I guess we'll see. But it's uh, Charles Soule and and uh, and uh, and Ryan Brown have been have been weaving a very interesting story. So it's I, I'm gonna I'm looking forward to seeing how this thing wraps up. Hyper, my original art collection would make the Smithsonian jealous too, for sure. No doubt. But you only get one wish, though. That's the thing. Is it the comics or is it the art? I maybe maybe you can ask for both. <laughs> every piece of art that Jack Kirby drew. Ooh. That's a lot. That'd be a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot of stuff. That'd be a lot of stuff. All right. Uh, my third pick. La Muerta Primeval from Coffin Comics by way of Kickstarter. Uh, this is the eighth La Muerta book that uh, Brian Polito has put out from Coffin Comics. Until recently, that was the only way to get them, but eventually they started showing up uh, via Boundless. No, not Boundless. I guess it is Coffin Comics in uh, previews. Yeah. Yeah, that, that they have been showing up this and Hell Witch and then his ongoing uh, Lady Death has been going on for a little while. And actually, he just announced. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, Brian Polito announced uh, what is coming up in 2023, and he is adding two new characters, each with their own title to the Lady Death. Hell Witch, uh, La Muerta universe. And mm -hmm. so there will be a fourth and a fifth book coming out. Okay. Uh, next year, he has scheduled two Lady Deaths, one La Muerta, and one Hell Witch. And then these two new titles. So I'm looking forward to that. But this, this is a story about a young lady who was a Green Beret. A young lady who is a Green Beret. 
here in the U.S. Um, yeah, boundless is, uh, that's different stuff, though. That's all the stuff he did, I think, before he put together this Coffin Comics, because it's got the, um, it's got several characters that he hasn't been doing in Coffin Comics. That's why I think it's different. Yeah. Um, and then Avatar. Oh, you you bring up Avatar. You know, I think in this previews that is coming on its way now, there is an actual new solicitation from Avatar. The really? first one since the pandemic. Yeah. Huh. I believe I saw that they have a so brand new book. So they still survive. Or they survive, I guess. Uh, they, they've been advertising all their other books, all their variant covers, groupings, you know, five issues of this and five, I mean, just anything except new material. And and I believe in this coming uh, previews <laughs> right at the end of the year um, is, and actually it'll come out what? No, it'll come out in December. One, yeah, it'll come out in right, December, yeah. Yeah, right at the end of the year, I believe. We'll, we'll see if, if maybe I misrecall that. But uh, Maria Diaz, former Green Beret, uh, she found an occasion that she also, much like the Dead End Moon girl, asked a being for help. Um, this being was a female called Santa Muerta, and she gave her some uh, modified supernatural abilities. I mean, she's not like a Doctor Strange or anything like that. She's not like a Hulk or anything like that. Uh, but but she does have some enhanced... Oh, also, uh, this is a, a Daredevil uh, 1 homage cover. Oh, yeah. yeah it's I believe nice. by the... Well, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll wait and see, Hyper. I, I, I read something somewhere, might have been Bleeding Cool, uh, about solicitations. And I thought that what I saw solicited was something brand new that I had not seen from them before. So um, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see in, in previews. All right, maybe we can look it up online now. I, I think it's out there. Um, and, and see, maybe, maybe I just misread something. But it was just one book, like that's going to be five issues or something like that, but it was only one. Whereas, you know, anybody that knows Avatar back before the pandemic, they had 15 or 20 books coming out. So we'll see. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, much uh, diversion there. La Muerta, Green Beret, Miss Diaz, granted powers by Santa Muerta. Well, she, she goes on a personal mission in this issue, the eighth issue, the first seven was actually a story of something happened. She felt that she needed revenge. She started working on revenge. Mission after mission after mission after seven issues, she finally got revenge on the big bad that she had been wronged by. In this one, she gets a call from members of her Green Beret, her, her former Rangers unit, about their leader falling into some difficulty. And, of course, um, hard times like that, uh, serving in a, a ranger battalion in, you know, the Middle East or the jungles of wherever, South America or Africa or, you know, wherever they would go, Mozambique, um, breed, breeds a fealty to each other that is going to be pretty hard to, to set down when you get a call for help. So uh, they go to help their former CO. And uh, she is told by uh, Santa Muerta on the trip to um, Col um, somewhere in South America, Brazil. She lives in Mexico. So all of her adventures, the first seven issues have been in Peru, uh, have been in Mexico. In this issue, she goes to Peru because that's where her CO was seen. On the trip, Santa Muerta tells her, um, you're going somewhere where the forces are so dark, even I can't help you. So hmm. you will not have your powers. And she's like, uh, got to go help my dog. Okay, thanks yeah. for nothing. So she goes and, and she is able to hold her own just with her own, you know, Green Beret training. Um, we have seen reading other issues connections to the greater uh, Lady Death universe, because all three of these books 
intertwine some amount. Mm-hmm. Uh, La Muerta has been the least of the three having to do with the other two. The other two, Lady Death and Hell Witch, they're both beings of hell. And so, of course, that's a easy connection to make. Oh, yeah. Well, this is a human being on Earth. And so you have to write a little bit more to make that connection because she's she's not died. She's never been to hell. She's, you know, so. But now, uh, Dia de la Muerta, the Day of the Dead, of course, the dead is going to be a connection. And that's, that's what they work on. Uh, but in this issue, it turns out that there is a secret scientific organization that had acquired in the past some of the DNA from Lady Death. And used that DNA to try to weaponize that DNA. Right. In essence, is what they attempted to do. And they did to some extent. And and that the result of that in the jungles of Peru is what has caused the issue involving her CO that the rest of her unit and she get tangled up in that costs the lives of everyone that goes down there except Miss Diaz. She's the only survivor of their little mission. Even the dude they went to rescue doesn't make it out. Uh, so we we see, and, and this is uh, that, that story uh, line, trying to do something with Lady Death's DNA. Actually, in the Lady Death book, that has become a huge story point there that mm-hmm. somehow... And that is a question that is yet answered. Someone on Earth at some point in her traipsings to Earth and back to hell and where acquired some of Lady Death's DNA and has been using it. Uh, It's been sold on the black market. It's been used by several military industrial complexes here on Earth, experiments and things like that. So Lady Death is having to deal with that kind of a la... Uh, Tony Stark's Iron Wars. Yeah. That's what Lady Death is into right now, trying to do that same thing here on Earth because she understands how um, unfortunate things could be if they find a way to to use her, basically, on on Earth. Yeah. And uh, uh, Miss Diaz uh, finds that out. Her mission is a failure, but in that her CO dies at her hands she knows at least he is at peace and so in that aspect the mission is over he was rescued which ultimately was the goal Uh, and she goes back to uh, i assume mexico with this lady death-esque creature excuse me um now tracking and presumably going to pursue her from its home in the jungles of Peru to uh, whatever town it is she is from in Mexico. I forget. So she's bringing it back with her in essence. She doesn't know. And it's not like she's contaminated or anything like that. It's the case of where the bad person found a way to track you and they will track you back to your, to your hole and Mm -hmm. attack you there. And so that's what is going to be the story, presumably in the next issue of this book. Cool. Now these are what are they? They're like double or triple size. Uh, they are. Let's see if they're they're not paginated. I don't think not numbered. But yeah, they they're they're not twenty three. They are big enough to square bind. Square bind. Yeah. Um, it's probably forty five to fifty pages. Yeah, that's good. That's good size. Yep. Cool. And yeah, because I know he he sort of alternates when they do the Kickstarters and stuff. So, mm-hmm. so to give that kind of um, a chunk of reading, you know, for each one, sort of, I was like, hold you over until the next time they get around, get around to that cycle for the next issue. But, right. Yeah. This this is the one that just came in, which means it finished well with the pandemic. I don't remember. I think it might oh, have yeah. finished at the beginning of the year or something like that, but while this was being shipped, he was um, kickstarting, I believe the next lady death issue. Yeah. It still may be active. I'm, I'm not sure. And then after the lady death will be the next hell, Witch yeah. issue. Yeah. Good stuff. He's got the, he's got that machine cranking. He doing- is the best at 
the um, added value goodie bag of any Kickstarter. Oh yeah, that I've seen some of that stuff. That's an it, add on on top of add on. Oh, yeah, and it, it's 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 its own it's its own market. Um, <laughs> this this book came bagged, right? I got a uh, a black and white ash can of a previous issue, um, also with this, and then a separate bag, a separate comic book bag, mm-hmm. full of all the goodies, the bookmarks oh, wow. and the magnets and the yeah. trading cards and the. Uh, I've, I've said this before. One time I got a condom and uh, <laughs> there has been, this one had a coaster and just uh, all kinds of stuff. Now yeah. don't think you don't pay for those. Oh yeah. You yeah. pay up for the privilege of having Brian Polito merch for sure. Yeah. Um, so much so that when I started this trip uh, back a ways, uh yes, I, yeah, he, he agrees. Yeah, he works Kickstarter as well as anybody that that I participate with. Yeah, he truly has it down to a science. He he works the machine, and the machine works correctly. Yeah. He he makes. I I don't believe that I remember it. It's a little different with the pandemic, but mm-hmm. the pandemic notwithstanding, I don't believe I have gotten an email from Polito through Kickstarter with the, oh, oh, I need to apologize because right, yeah. <laughs> there are no excuses for that man. Yeah. He has his ducks in a row before he starts the Kickstarter. Yeah, that's good. It, it, it is just, it is remarkable. The, and, oh, the money the man has to make from this because every book will fund within the first 24 hours. Oh yeah. Oh, I've always, I've seen every, every single one of them do it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, talking about the prices, I, I have paid for physical for all the hell, Witch books and all of the, uh, La Muerta books. I got in about seven or eight issues later on the lady death books and because of that, I have not bought any of those physically. I always buy those digitally. Oh, okay. So, gotcha. unfortunately, I don't get the Lady Death goodie packs. But, you know, catching up for 12 and 15 bucks a book for, uh, at the time, it would have been eight books when I jumped onto mm-hmm. his Kickstarter. So, I just, I couldn't do that. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I didn't want to start collecting them physically without having them all physically. I, yeah. I can get them all digitally. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. But when I started the La Muerta and the Hell Witch, I started getting them physically. So yeah. unfortunately I would love to be able to go back and, and every time he offers a digital catch up and a physical catch up. Yeah. And, and, and I would love to do it. Every but time. I'm like, oh man, that's just so much money. Yeah. And I'm tempted every time. Oh, and Hyper's right. Not only uh, oh yeah, have it no, no. backed in 24 hours, but like well over. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's usually a solid five digits yeah. is his goal. Yeah, and you know I have sat there. Um, you know when I get the notice now, uh, as soon as I get the notice, I'll go and and go to it, and yeah. I have sat there and watched the money ring up. Oh yeah, yeah. It just oh, I love that. That's, that's fun circulate. to watch. Yeah. Especially if you're early into it, yeah, like that the first day or first. Oh hour man, yeah, it just it just I rolls because everybody's like, "Oh, I gotta get in there," so that Dude. that thing just yep. keeps going. So. And he does, you know, he does the typical stuff early, early in, you know, yep. people who do it the first twenty four hours, the first week, whatever. Um, he does the stretch goals, and he does. Uh, now he is really bad for stretch goal being the availability to pay more money for something else. And right. I'm like, yeah, that's uh, not a stretch goal. Yeah. That's, that's not really a stretch on. goal, Brian, but okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, and all of this, when, when you uh, go to check out everything uh, except the open stretch goals, but everything is available as an add on all the covers, yep. collections of covers, individual, co- you know, whatever you want to do, a catch up physical, a catch up digital. Yeah. He, he, his is the example, I think of how to do a Kickstarter. Now, oh, you know, yeah. you don't have to do it as big as he does it, but the way that he does it. 
Well, and I, I think you're, what you said earlier is right with any Kickstarter to have your ducks in a row prior to launching it is key. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that you need to have the printed copy sitting in front of you when you start it, but don't, don't do a Kickstarter before you've even started to draw it. No, I no. And that is, you know, we've, we, we've talked about this at nauseum. I know when it, talking about Kickstarters, but there are so many Kickstarters that I've backed that I know other people have backed that that is the kicker. That's, that's the right. delay is that they launch it with the hopes that, Oh, this money is going to support me while I spend all of this time drawing. Right. You should have already done that. Yep. This is your reward for all the time and effort that it took. And if you do it right, you will make the money back plus make a profit. Exactly. Uh, Hyper to have such a large scale crowdfunding campaign as he it's, does. It is amazing. How, oh, I mean, it's, it's it is, and he's it's, got a huge team too. Pluto's yeah. got a, I've, I've seen photos and stuff of them at cons and stuff. It's That's remarkable. a huge team. I mean, 10 or 15 people. You know, so. pretty much Kickstarter has funded Coffin Comics. Oh, That's yeah. where he has got the money for, for his company there. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Um, you know, m- meanwhile, I, I am waiting for things on 50 and 60 oh. year comic vets. And I'm like, uh, what, what are you doing? What? Oh, it's painful. You know, it's or, painful. or other people that are like, what? You, you don't know anybody that's ever done a Kickstarter that you could go and find out that this is what was going to happen yeah. before you started? Yeah. I mean, really, you don't know. There's nobody you could have gone to to ask advice yeah. for help. Yeah, so. It's not true, folks. There are. There are people out there. Uh, it just, it, Brian Polito, ask yeah. him, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? He may how not tell you stuff? exactly how the sausage is made, but he's going to at least get you... He, close. he won't tell you his spices, right. but he'll tell you the process to make the sausage. Exactly. Then you just add your own spices, which exactly. is the point of Kickstarter, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, and like Hyper said, the scale, that yeah. is what is just mind blowing for mm-hmm. uh, Polito and Coffin Comics. I mean, he, he, he has it planned out. He just released in 2023, the books and the order of the books and two other books that, you know, he's not sure, but they will fit into the schedule as well. Yeah. We should have a whole episode just on Kickstarter so, stuff. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would be afraid because I would point out some people to not back. Right. As well. And, and well, that's true. Yeah. Loud and clear. Yeah, uh, so. That's very true. All right. Well, let me finish up. Okay. Do my yes. last book here. Uh, I'll, I'll be kind of quick on it because uh, really, there's not a whole lot to say. It's, it's um, the final issue of the storyline. This but is not the, the final, final issue. Yeah, of the book. this is Grim Number Five from Boom Studios. This is the yeah. This is the final issue of this opening story arc. Um, the book will return. I think they said in December, so mm-hmm. yeah, or something I like that. So, so, um, so we're, we're definitely going to get more of Jessica and and the whole crew and everything. Um, so, I. Re- it's one of those stories I don't really like spoiling too much because I think a lot of people are still catching up <laughs> in this book. Uh, yes, I um, exactly. Yeah, I'm not going to share that on the screen, but yeah, totally. Um, as he points out people's names that we have spoken about before on this show. Um, but yeah, so this story arc comes to a close um, and you've got to leave it on, uh, you've got to provide some explanation of what's been going on. You've got to sort of bring some of the story to a conclusion. And then you've got to give some sort of tease of future storytelling. This issue does all of that. It, it gives you some explanations uh, of what's going on, of how uh, the Grim Reaper is where he is, how he got in that situation. Willingly is really the the uh, short answer to it is like he willingly put himself in this, into this position. Um, and, uh, the, the, I, f- I felt that the sort of sacrifice that was made in this issue was sort of uh, almost tropey. Like 
I I saw it's not that I saw it coming. I just when it happened, I was kind of like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, Hyper, if anyone isn't sure about Grim, you really need to give it a try. See, there you go, Hyper, endorsed by Hyper. Uh, I'm still mad I missed the first issue somehow. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, pick up the trade, man. That's the easiest thing to do. So, um, but yeah, so. But the cliffhanger to this, or not the cliffhanger, but really the ending of it, uh, to get us on to the next thing is that Jessica and her and her crew are now stuck in the mortal plane. Uh, they do not have uh, means to travel anymore, uh, which is their sights, and uh, and then the story is going to go from there. So. Um, I'm sure that the story will be more about them trying to figure out how to get back to limbo to deal with, uh, everything that's going on there. Um, the coup that is happening, um, and probably a little bit about what happened, what's happening with the Grim Reaper. So, uh, we are teased at the very end, sort of as an in credit scene, uh, of someone, uh, who feels that no one knows who they are or is aware of them. So that's a nice little tease. Uh, so, so yeah. So all in all, I think it, it ended well. I mean, like I said, there were a couple little tropey things there, but you know, it's not a deal breaker by any stretch. I think everything's going to have some tropes in along the way. Um, but it's still uh, Flaviano's, Art is still amazing. I think Stephanie Phillips has crafted a really good story. Uh, I think it is very uh, much uh, believe the hype. And it, it was it was good before the hype. And I think when everybody realized, oh, this is another one of those boom first issues, we all needed to jump on board. And then they all read it and they were like, oh, wait, oh, this is, this, this is actually a really good comic. So uh, I think that helps. Um, and there's more of these type stories, these supernatural stories, uh, coming from boom, from a variety of creators. So, uh, don't hesitate and, and miss out on those books. Cause I think you're going to get a lot of, a lot of what hyper said, you know, uh, I can't believe I, f- I missed the first issue kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, good, good ending to this arc. I'm looking forward to, to where it goes. Uh, definitely this did not disappoint once whatsoever so good stuff i can't hear you at all can you there hear me you now? go yeah, all right sorry you about that. um yeah. hyper uh, i'm looking at uh, my comic shop and they currently i don't know what your needs are for a first issue uh, but they have a fourth printing in stock apparently oh there you so, go so um, if, you know, if you're willing to, to dip down that low in the print run, I, you know, again, I don't know what it is, uh, you desire, but it would give you a physical first issue. It is the, uh, uh, it is listed as L one L as far as the, the cover, the edition, I guess yeah. is, is what you would call it. So, yeah, there's quite a few of those, unfortunately. <laughs> well, it's, it's in its fourth printing. So. And, yeah. and on top of uh, what my comic shop has down to I, so it'd be yeah A, A and B would be okay, but C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So that's seven variants. Yeah. Yeah, there's foils, and yeah. which is the other big thing that Boom likes to do. Um, well, they're, you know, they're, they're a little behind. They're trying to catch up with dynamite and, and do, doing their, their best to do that. Uh, don't say that. Please don't say that. Well, I, you know, hey, I don't, I'm, I don't need boom going, Hey, you know what? We need 26 variant covers for this issue. And, and I, that reminds me back about a comment somebody made about the dynamite covers. Um, dynamite is shameless with the covers. Doug S said, um, Oh, and, in 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 uh, they're only going to produce covers that sell right yeah i mean so if if they find out that it's not worth the money they will quit so obviously somebody buys those books to the extent that uh it makes dynamite enough money to keep doing it so 
you know, dynamite. It's like, well, yeah, they're offering it. Well, yeah, but somebody is buying them. Yeah. You know, so yeah, like, I mean, there's not there's not a retailer out there that is ordering, and I'll pull a number out of my head. You know, 500 copies of uh, Vampirella Year One Issue Four. You know, just because it they think it's going to sell eventually, they've got someone who is buying, or some ones plural buying all of those variant covers in the high dollar ratio covers. Yep. That's I mean, why they're ordering that many. So they're, they'll, they're not getting stuck with them. Yeah. They'll turn around and just, you know, after they either break even or make some money, they'll just throw those books in the dollar bin or put them in the back stock for a little bit. Hopefully they'll sell there. And if not, they'll throw them in the dollar bin at some point. And, you know, that's when Chris swoops in and buys them. <laughs> No, no, not really. <laughs> I tend to buy those as soon as they come out. Like and subscribe, kids, and let's make crit. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, I would like Arthur. to be a YouTube superstar, but I hadn't got to the closing comments, but I appreciate I'm, that. <laughs> I'm okay with our with our small inclusive world yes. that we have of me and Chris and uh, six to eight people watching every sure. week. That's that's Works cool for me. I'm good to you go. Know, Ten to twelve of us total. That's that's a good insular insular yep. group. See in hyper. See you're right there with me. Dollar bin collector. Love the dollar bin. I I don't have any dollar bins. My closest dollar bin is probably two hours away. Oh, see, and that's the thing. I've got one locally, and I've been through the dollar bin section so often. He's not putting enough new stuff in it. So it's not, I basically right. just have to wait a month. Right. Yeah. And, to or, make it worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when it, when it starts off as, you know, like four boxes and then it gets up to eight boxes, I'm like, oh, okay. There's a lot of new stuff. Here. Ah, new stuff. Yeah. So I got to go through, yeah. find all my early image stuff that I got to, I got to buy. So, but yeah, uh, I guess that's it for the show. Got anything else? I, I don't think so. Cool. All right. Well, this was episode 150. I uh, appreciate everybody coming out and joining us and checking us out. You can come by the website, comicaddiction.net. Join us over at the forums at justanotherfanboy.freeforums.net. You can email the show at comicaddictionpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Comic Addiction. You can follow Ed at Teal Productions. You can follow me at Chris Parton. All of those contact bits of information are in the show notes. Either come by the website and check it out or when you're listening to the podcast. Uh, Hyper, I don't have any locally, but every store I can go to, oh, for sure. If it's got a dollar section, that's one... It's one of the spots I'll hit before I leave. Uh, I try my best. Any sh- any store that I go to, um, even <laughs> if they don't have what I specifically am looking for, I will go through the dollar bin in hopes that I can uh, find it. And what episode? What, apparently, the episode number was a surprise hyper. Uh, great giant anniversary episode with seventeen variants. It is all gold foil. Uh, thank you very much. It's it, that's what you're supposed to do with 150, right? Gold foil, diamond encrusted logo. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, um, come by. Let's see. Come to the website. YouTube. Hey, we do it live on YouTube every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, be sure to subscribe like Doug or not Doug, but hyper said subscribe and hit the, hit the like button or hit the bell. So you're notified for whatever of all that stuff. Um, and, uh, so, you know, when we go live and all that other cool stuff. So I set up a reminder every Thursday at some point. So definitely come by if you're not subscribed and click on the reminder so that you can know when the show is going to start, but it's 9 PM. Eastern Standard Time. We're here. Whether we're talking about some random thing we were talking about off, you know, off, uh, off the live feed before we started, or jumping right in like we did tonight. So, either one, it's all good. Appreciate everybody who came by the show, uh, the YouTube channel, and hung out with us in the chat. As always, uh, definitely welcome aboard uh, Stephen Orr as the executive producer of the podcast. Ed, uh, Ed is uh, as is always. 
Ed jumps in um, super early in the week and starts clearing out the show notes. Sometimes before I, uh, I get a chance to make a copy of them to make the show notes for the podcast. Oh, and, oh no, I, you, no, it's fine. Don't worry. I'm, I'm well, I'm, I'm much what, faster now. <laughs> what, well, and, and this is, this is what I, I do it say. now. I do it. As soon as we get off the show, I make a copy. This is what I will say. Um, I have a spreadsheet saved where I have copied and pasted every FOC, every, Oh, uh, okay. Review comic and every upcoming book that we have talked about. So I, I have all of that in a spreadsheet, um, just a list, basically, right. if, if it's something that you need. Because that's something I've been doing because I want to try to not repeat anything between the three. Oh, for sure. And yeah. always, you know, which... Oh, I screw that up all the time. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily work out. I mean... You know, plus uh, it's, it's, I've always wondered, well, I wonder if anybody is like put off by the fact that I recommend something and then I never talk about it. Like I don't follow up. I don't read it either. Piece of shit. I don't, you know, so I, <laughs> oh, I'm really bad about that. No, I'll bring you up know, something so, in previews and then I'll talk about it on FOC and then I'll talk about it coming up next week. And then I may even review it. Well, so. I, well but I mean, isn't that kind of the way that it should be if it, it you know, be. I mean, yeah logically following it. yeah so that's the thing that's the format we set up but i think it's great that the two of us do it opposite well my, my thought is to is to cast as wide a net as i can. yes yeah but here like particularly this week it it, oh, it sometimes gets kind of difficult yeah. too and you know i'm like wait didn't i foc and i talked about that in previews too dang yeah. Yeah, you know, it's just the way it goes sometimes. It's a struggle sometimes, but it is what it is. So, yep. yeah, I mean, there's definitely those weeks. So, um, but yeah, sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't realize that I was. Well, no, being interfering behind, with anything that you were doing. No, being behind uh, doing the podcast. That's that was the issue beforehand. It wasn't an issue, uh, but when you're three episodes behind getting it posted to the feed, and you go back and do the show notes, like, oh crap. <laughs> Okay. But luckily I know how to use uh, uh Google Google Drive's uh previous versions and stuff like uh, that. Ah yes, okay. So technologically smart. Well just, now just you a know little if, bit there. If so. anything happens, I um I usually will copy. make a copy of that. Yeah. And I, I if have there's like someone who indexes it. things, it's you. I should have uh, known that. I, I try. I, yes. Except <laughs> for the first episode that we did, because we didn't use the Google sheets oh that's true yeah and and i'm too lazy to go back and listen to it and pick mm-hmm. it out from listening to it so it's in the show I, notes man it's I in the show notes oh I'll, I'll have to go back and see yeah right. now so it's like me he doesn't go back and listen to the show he's like i was there what do i need exactly. to listen to it <laughs> I was now i there. will i will download it so that we get mark for a download. get the numbers <laughs> yeah i do that but yeah i'm like why am i gonna li- I, I was there I, I, no uh. <laughs> That's why I go back and listen to old episodes. I, like, I download from, all from a decade too. ago. You know? <laughs> I download it. Like, oh, I don't remember it, saying that. Oh, yep. Okay. After I download it, I'm like, okay, drop, drop, <laughs> drop. Because, you know, <laughs> I was there the whole time. It's not a problem. I think I was there. I'm pretty sure. It's a... Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, everybody, thank y'all for, again, stopping by and listening to us on the show. Uh, we will get the audio podcast caught up here uh, in the next couple weeks. Uh, but we are, now that Steven's on board, uh, we will definitely uh, be getting a lot better than we were uh, for the last couple of weeks. So, again, thanks thanks to him. Thanks all of y'all for listening. Doug, or Doug. I almost said Doug, as always, thanks for joining us. But always, thanks for joining us. You too, Hyper. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh, it hurts my head uh ed as always thank you for joining me yes sir and we will catch all of you next week for episode 151 good night ciao god my head hurts (laughs) i I don't even my my mouth will not slow down enough for my brain to catch up All right, everybody in the chat, we will check y'all next time. Goodbye. Ending broadcast now.